Very good afternoon and welcome to our webinar for today called How to Invest in 2016. Now, gentlemen, let's look forward. Let's look into 2016 and I want to start off with you, Roger. What themes are going to kick us off next year? Okay, thanks, uh, Shepard. Um, well, the first thing is it'll be a mistake uh, to um, to focus on yields. So it's it's absolutely vital that um, the apparent attraction of the yields uh, in the banks after the sell-off doesn't lure people into what we call a value trap, uh, and that's where they believe something is cheap, but the shares could fall further. And and it's important that you buy high quality business, which, which, which for example, the Commonwealth Bank and, and Westpac particularly are very high quality businesses. Um, but we also need to buy businesses with bright prospects. And there were two recommendations that were set down by David Murray's financial system inquiry. Recommendation one was that the banks increase their, uh, increase their, uh, Tier 1 capital, what's called their set 1 capital or common equity tier 1 capital uh, to, uh, to a level that made them unquestionably strong and the second recommendation was that they increase their risk weighting, their mortgage risk weighting ratios and that was in order to level the playing field with some of the regional banks. Now the impact of these two things when you lift capital and you reduce the amount you can leverage that capital through the mortgage risk weighting ratios. In other words, when, I should just take a step back. When In recommendation two, what that meant was that for every dollar of capital that the banks had, they couldn't lend as much to mortgages. So their ability to leverage their capital, even though they had more capital, they needed more capital and they couldn't leverage it as much. So that reduces the return on equity for the banks. And the other thing that we noticed was that if you go back and you have a look at the profit growth of the banks uh, in the bottom section of this table here between 2011 and 2015, the reason why I chose 2011 is because I didn't want to um, look at the share price appreciation from the depths of the GFC, which was 2009, March 2009. So I wanted to cut that rally out and just have a look at what happened to share prices between 2000. 2011 and 2015, and what we saw was that there was a 30% increase in the profits in aggregate of the big four banks, but a 73% increase in the share prices. So the share prices got well ahead of themselves, and they the banks were expensive. Um, so that meant they're expensive. Now they look cheaper, and they definitely are cheap. There's no doubt about that. But the risk, of course, is that their return on equity is going down or going to be flat. So their prospects aren't as attractive as they were. And I think what we'll find is we'll find that a lot of the uh, a lot of the um, analysts will start to. Um, lowers some of their forecasts for bank profits in the future. So investors have moved, looked for yields in banks. There's also, a, and there's risk there now. They've also looked for yields in property. And the big danger there, of course, is that the banks have, uh, have capped how much they're lending on investor loans. They've also increased their rate, uh, interest rates on investor loans. Um, ASIC, in addition to this, and it's not on the slide, but in addition to this, ASIC investigated 140, they just took 140 uh, interest-only loans and assessed them for risk. Uh, and what they found was that banks were not responsibly lending. They weren't giving lender borrowers the information that they required to make a proper assessment of the risk. Uh, they were underestimating, sorry, overestimating how much time borrowers had to pay back uh, their mortgages. Uh, um, after the no interest period or the zero interest rate period uh, expired and, and so, sorry, the interest only period expired. Uh, and so um, there's a big risk that we're going to see property prices uh, not go up. Demand for property will go down because the cost of borrowing money has gone up and that will ultimately shoot the banks in the foot uh, in terms of their prospects for growth. So their capital has gone up, that reduces return on equity, their growth rates are going to slow slightly, that's going to reduce their return on equity and that changes their prospects for valuation increases and so that changes the prospects for their share price increases. Uh, what about the macro picture? Well Australia is very much, and I was quoted in the Australian newspaper the other day saying Australia is in a fetal position 
mission with its fingers crossed. Uh, and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, there's a lot of thumb sucking going on uh, about what our prospects look like, and they're very much tied to this graph. This is fixed asset investment and gross fixed capital por uh, formation in China. And what you can see is this is what's driven our demand uh, for iron ore and coal, or China's demand for our iron ore and coal. And you can see it's falling in a heap as of 2014. It's even lower than that now in 2015. And what's important to take away from this is that the property sector in China uh, demands or uses about 25% of uh, is 25% of fixed asset formation and that's a big consumer of steel uh, and that's declining and in fact in residential real estate in China there's about 10.8 months of excess inventory so we've got almost a year of inventory in China everywhere else in the world where there's been a year or two or three years of, of inventory property prices have fallen commercial, res commercial real estate in China has already fallen 50% in terms of price, it's, it's halved, and they had three years of excess supply of inventory. So residential real estate's fallen about 8% so far, and it's probably going to fall further. So demand for iron ore and, and coal is not going to increase anytime soon. Infrastructure, uh, the development of roads and bridges and so forth, that's 22%. Uh, of demand for uh, fixed assets and what's happened is local banks, uh, local governments borrowed money from the People's Bank of China to develop these cities and roads and bridges and railways and they're only getting about a 3% return on their assets but the loans, the money that they borrowed from the People's Bank of China is being repaid at 7% so they're losing money, there's no demand to build more infrastructure by the local governments and that means uh, again no reason to expect iron ore to increase. Now I notice, I notice that um, Nev has written in a question, should I buy BHP, why or why not? Uh, um, and Sandra's asked, would you take a loss on BHP to buy a better opportunity? I can't answer those questions directly, but I'm giving you a picture of BHP's outlook now. You know, the iron ore price could drop considerably further uh, from here. Manufacturing uh, is 33%. Uh, of, uh, of demand uh, and uh, it's slowing down dramatically. So it's very important to understand uh, that the outlook for Australia is very much tied to uh, China uh, and the outlook uh, is uh, not improving, uh, not from China anyway. Um, what does that mean for the Australian dollar? Well, here's a bloke that's uh, taking a dive uh, and, uh, and that's probably the best chart I can give you of the Australian dollar at the moment. Our view is that there might be a short-term bounce. Uh, GDP numbers might surprise on the upside. The next GDP number for Australia might be a little stronger than everyone expects, uh, but longer term we think the pressure is on the downside. Um, and that's a good thing for domestic tourism. Uh, so the outlook for domestic tourism uh, is probably good. Uh, the, domestic, the outlook for domestic retail is probably improving because buying things from overseas is not as cheap as it was with the Australian dollar going down. And there's a few other stocks we're going to talk about for 2016 in just a moment. But having painted a very bleak picture for Australia, let me tell you, we're in the business of investing in, div in individual businesses, as everyone listening is as well, uh, and so we're looking for individual businesses with bright prospects. We're not going to sell all the stocks we own because we think the outlook for Australia uh, is muted. Great. Now, Chris, Roger touched on China. What, what, what's your take on that theme? Yeah, okay, Sheva. Well, well, I'll... Um extend what Roger was saying. I, I'm in total agreement, you know, obviously infrastructure and construction growth in China has completely fallen off a cliff. But uh, the other side to that is domestic consumption by the middle class in China and that has been growing. Um, this, this quote here from President Barack Obama where he said, China in particular should unleash its emerging middle class by accelerating its transition to a consumption-led economy. As President Xi Jinping has acknowledged China's export and construction driven growth is no longer sustainable. So that's the second part of that's what Roger talked about and the first bit which is not on the screen but the, the first bit to that quote was about unleashing the, the middle class to a consumption led economy. Uh, what we're seeing in China is now the service industries make up half of China's economy and we're seeing a growing appetite amongst that uh, now considerably large middle class for consumer goods, for travel, for uh, cars in particular. We're also seeing online retailing really booming in China. 
and things like Tmall Global or JD.com, these are uh, websites in China which are kind of like the eBay in China and they, they are turning over astonishing amounts of, um, of, of revenue, of transactions and, and this actually presents opportunities for Australian companies because Australian companies can sell into China using those particular platforms. Um, and on that same note, the free trade agreement which was signed uh, in June of this year and is in the process now of being implemented is also opening up uh, opportunities within uh, for Australian companies to sell into China, things like wine, vitamins, health food, um, the very topical baby formula to have young children, uh, agricultural and, and, and food products. There's opportunities for these businesses uh, within China. So. You know, the upside, if you like, to the China equation is this this growing middle class. Yeah, but I guess, I guess that where, where that leads us to is well, what, what in particular what sectors and what stocks are going to be impacted by the um, by some of these trends that you know, Roger and myself have identified, and um, we, we've both already alluded to with the falling Australian dollar, um, China's growing middle class. Some, some of the sectors that you might want to look at are education and also inbound tourism. If you can just pull up that, that chart, Shepard, this shows how overseas visitors to Australia have been steadily growing. That, you know, that's over, what's that, 30 years and you can see a, a good strong growth rate in, in arrivals in Australia and if we go to the next chart, it shows the percentage of those people that are coming from China and we can see that, that uh, China is really accounting for a, a growing percentage of, of, uh, sorry, of, of um, inbound tourism. We're, we're seeing that you know, just here in our offices, we're just opposite the fish, Sydney's fish markets and we see busloads of Chinese tourists arriving every day. I've had a, had a friend who's here from China and they wanted to get on a tour, sightseeing tour and all the Chinese speaking sightseeing tours are booked out. There's a, a lot of demand in, in that particular area. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much, Roger, and thank you very much, oh, Chris. It's a pleasure. pleasure. And, uh, pleasure see you guys next time. Investing in shares can be rewarding when you do your research, but it can also take up a lot of your time. With so much information out there, how do you quickly sort through the companies worth investing in and those to steer clear of? Scaffold is my research tool of choice. It tracks and reports on all ASX listed companies, plus thousands of global stocks daily, helping me decide which stocks to buy and sell. I can quickly filter through the reports to get the information I need. The rating system is like a set of traffic lights for the stock market. Green is good, orange is caution and red is don't go any further. Scaffold's top stock choices have been highlighted for their outstanding performance by Money Magazine. With Scaffold doing the work for me, I have the confidence to make investment decisions without having to spend hours sifting through financial data. Now you can take control of your time and your portfolio. Why not take Scaffold for a test drive today?